don't want that. Um, I'm just looking for this. Can you see the laser pointer now on the screen as well? Uh, yes. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so yeah, this is this is the kind of uh, I need to work out how to erase that bit there. Um, <coughs> sorry, this is my this is my second Zoom talk, so I, I always find it a little bit awkward doing these uh, because it's like you're just kind of screaming into the void and getting no response. Uh, although if you have seen one of my talks before, you'd wonder what's changed. Uh, so yeah. So uh, the talk I'm going to give today is on low rank approximations for open system evolutions. Uh, and actually, this should uh, tie in quite nicely with the talk Kurt is giving later. But for now, let's, uh, let's get started. <coughs> so uh, first of all, uh, open systems and quantum technologies. Why would you care about this? Well, for one thing, in quantum technologies, you have this idea that coherence is a resource. It's something you can do, use to uh, <coughs> uh, produce uniquely quantum behaviors. Uh, and things like uh, quantum computing or cryptography uh, or signaling or analog uh, quantum simulations, they all need coherence. But coherence is quite a fragile thing, as we all know, uh, and can easily be destroyed by environmental interactions. And in some cases with environmental engineering, it can also be enhanced. So generally, when you've got your kind of quantum system and an environment, uh, the coherences you want to protect are destroyed by this environment. So one of the most important things we can do to try and kind of mitigate against this is that we need to have a way of modeling this kind of open system environment interaction in order to understand it better and to be able to kind of work with environments uh, rather than have them fight us all the time. And this is, this is kind of just what's being said here, uh, that what we want are kind of, is a kind of efficient way to model the evolution of an open system. So how are open systems evolved? Well, as uh, you already saw in Sai's uh, talk, you know, the Lindblad equation is the, gen the way people generally use, although there are others like uh, stochastic master equations, which we'll also get to. Uh, but uh, the main point is that open systems are in general described by density matrices. And we want to kind of accurately model this, uh, the evolution of these density mat matrices. And one of the most common uh, equations that we use is the Lindblad equation, as you can see here. Uh, so, uh, as you can kind of see, there's this kind of Louisville part of the evolution uh, that you would expect the conversation with the Hamiltonian and the density matrix, and then you have these uh, this dissipative part uh, where these AKs are your sort of uh, dissipators or jump operators. Now. What is the problem with this kind of evolution equation? Well, let's compare it to something like the Schrodinger equation. Uh, now, in the Schrodinger equation, you're evolving a wave function, right? So if for an n-dimensional Hilbert space, this wave function is just going to be uh, kind of length n. And so evolving it by one time step involves this matrix vector multiplication. And so the computational complexity of this is going to be uh, of order n squared doing a matrix vector multiplication, and you need to store n complex elements. Uh, actually, in fact, uh, there's, there's a lower bound on this that I'll talk about in a second, uh, but we'll look at the Lindblad equation first. So in contrast to the Schrodinger equation, you have the Lindblad equation, where you evolve a density matrix instead. And this involves a matrix matrix multiplication with a computational complexity of order n cubed. And then in terms of the memory, you've got to store kind of uh, almost n squared complex elements versus n complex elements. Uh, now, when, any, when the Hilbert space dimension is small, this isn't too much of a problem, right? You know, um, if you're evolving just a kind of two-state system or a qubit, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, n, is, n is two, and uh, like uh, the constant time factors are larger than the scaling anyway, so evolving the Schrodinger equation and the Lindblad equation are essentially equivalent. Uh, now, actually, just a point about this thing of uh, that this matrix matrix multiplication has a complexity of order n cubed. This isn't actually quite true. Um, now, for really big matrices, uh, you can actually get this slight improvement with this thing known as the Stras Strassen algorithm, which, which gets it to uh, n to the 2.807. Uh, but with the kind of constant factors involved in this, let's just call it three, uh, because it doesn't really affect the argument too much. 
There is, in fact, uh, another algorithm relying on group theory uh, that has this, computa this asymptotic computational complexity, 2.373. Um, but it turns out to be completely useless for practical applications because it's an example of a galactic algorithm. Uh, now, a galactic al algorithm, if you've never heard of it, is one which, uh, in the limit, is the most efficient algorithm known, but the, uh, the scales at which this becomes the most efficient algorithm are so huge that there's no way you'd ever get kind of enough terrestrial data for it to be worth using. Uh, uh, an example of this is that, uh, and this is why I was mentioning this order n squared for matrix vector, is that there is the fastest known way to multiply two numbers together actually goes uh, with order n log n. Unfortunately, it's based on a 1729 dimensional Fourier transform and only reaches this state of efficiency when your numbers have 10 to the 10 to the 38 digits. So in a world where kind of you're trying to do cryptography with that many digits, um, you know, it, it's, it's impossible to imagine uh, some of these algorithms ever being uh, used practically. But nevertheless, it does exist. Um, and there are several conjectures which, if true, would make matrix matrix multiplication order n squared. But for practical purposes, you know, it's order n cubed versus uh, evolving a wave function, which is order n squared. <coughs> okay, so given this problem, that the scaling is much worse than with uh, wave functions, we'd like some kind of approximate method where we don't need... Uh, to evolve the full density matrix, but could instead evolve um, the wave function. Now, one of the common approaches is to use stochastic methods like uh, quantum jump trajectories, which are essentially Monte Carlo methods, uh, where essentially you evolve along and you have some with an effective Hamiltonian and you have some probability of a kind of jump occurring based on the, the dissipators that you have in the system. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, now, that can, kind of, that can work very well, but it does have some problems. Uh, for one, you know, uh, it, this isn't going to explore your configuration space evenly. Uh, you know, there's gonna be some areas where you're more likely to end up, up in than others. And it can be the case that actually, for the dynamics you're interested in, uh, most of the influence is coming from an area that's quite poorly sampled by your method. And there are ways around this, but it's important to say that with these approximate methods, there are problems. More than that, um, uh, if, if you are looking for somewhere where your dynamics is occurring in a kind of low probability area for these quantum jumps, uh, it may be that you're not getting good convergence with less than n stochastic realizations of the system, at which point you're kind of using as much uh, uh, as many resources as the exact evolution. So, you know, there's no, there's no point in using one of these approximate methods. So this is just something to keep in mind, that while there are already approximate solutions, they do not always work well. <coughs> so let's think of an alternative approach to how we can kind of create an approximate uh, method for evolving density matrices. Now, one of the things that we should be aware of is that any completely positive trace-preserving map can be represented in what's known as a Krauss form, okay, where, you, where essentially, uh, your map uh, has this kind of form on the right-hand side. Now, time evolution is a completely positive trace-preserving map, so we should expect that there is a way of kind of representing the evolution of an open system according to the Lindblad equation, or indeed any other valid Maastro equation, in this sort of form. Now, uh, <coughs> the constraint on these is that these kind of operators M, K have to collectively satisfy this, uh, this, uh, blah, blah, uh, this identity, where if you kind of sum over their kind of uh, product, you get the identity operator. Now, uh, one of the useful things about this is that when you put your kind of uh, master equation in this Krauss form, you know that if you kind of begin with a pure state, or indeed with kind of a mixed state, the generalization is kind of trivial, uh, you can actually express the expectation of any of your operators or anything you're interested in purely in terms of a set of wave functions. So, you know, if you, uh, if you start with kind of just this pure state, then at time zero, your expectation of O is going to be the expectation of O with just psi. But then 
at some later time to get uh, to get the expectation. All you need to do is kind of apply these Krauss operators to psi. You know, these will represent time evolution to some particular time. And then you can just sum over them uh, to get your expectation for the operator. Now, obviously, is this more efficient than kind of using something like the Lindblad equation? Well, if K is much smaller than the dimension of your Hilbert space, then obviously, yes, it will be. Uh, because then you're only having to think about uh, the action on, uh, you only have to think about a set of K wave functions rather than uh, a full kind of N, Q, N squared density matrix. So clearly, if you can kind of get your evolution equation into this Krauss form, uh, it's very useful for kind of numerically evolving your uh, system. But there is a problem. Uh, and that while you can have kind of all of these existence proofs for Krauss operators describing the evolution of open systems, um, the number and explicit form of these Krauss operators are really only known for a couple of special cases, uh, essentially a two-state system, right? Uh, you know what the Krauss operators are for that, but otherwise, uh, and I'm sure someone here will probably know more, more and be able to correct me, but there are really very few cases, if any, where in general you know what the Krauss operators are. So that's a problem. Uh, but our idea here first is to say, okay, so it, it, these Krauss operators aren't known in general, but can we get an approximate version of them? Um, uh, can we get an approximate version for an infinitesimal evolution? So we take our Lindblad equation and we kind of break it up into an infinitesimal evolution. So we just take the Lindblad equation we saw before, and, you know, we uh, get an expression for rho of t plus dt times rho t, and you know, it looks as you'd expect. Now what we'd like to do, uh, and it turns out, that it's actually possible to approximately represent this toward a dt squared in the Krauss form. And it, so it turns out that this is uh, equation five is equivalent to equation six. Uh, and you might go, okay, um, how are those two things related? Uh, I'd say this is probably an, uh, uh, the original thing, uh, which wasn't me, uh, I think was an example of the Feynman algorithm from Dennis uh, of just kind of staring very hard at equation five and then guessing what the answer had to be for these uh, unitaries UK and BK. Um, but I can show you here kind of what the answer is. Um, <coughs> and you can prove this once you know the answer, but uh, I won't do that here because it's a bit tedious. So uh, the thing to pay attention to is that with these kind of two operators, UK and BK, they differ essentially in how you're incorporating um, your dissipator into this sort of effective propagator. Uh, where you've got a kind of minus here and a plus here. Uh, the interesting thing is that to account for non-Hermitian dissipators, you end up having to get this extra bit here, uh, which makes these operators uh, non-unitary. Uh, but in the case of Hermitian dissipators, you get unitary operators. So that's worth, that's worth just kind of bearing in mind. This is, this is, a, <coughs> uh, this is a sort of, approximate Krauss form for uh, the Lindblad equation. And with that, it means that essentially we only need to kind of carry around K wave functions rather than, uh, so K times length N wave functions rather than an N cubed, uh, N squared density matrix. Now, the problem with this is that it's only an infinitesimal step, which means that after uh, m steps, you'll have 2k to the m wave functions that you have to worry about in order to take expectations. And so you can easily see that, you know, even if k is much smaller than the dimension of Hilbert space, after m, 2k to the m may not be. So what we do is we kind of pre-specify that there's some maximal rank that I want uh, some maximal number of wave functions that I want to store and I want to do calculations on. Now, after m steps, you know, our full density matrix is going to kind of look like this. Um, some sum from kind of k equals 1 to l. Uh, and that should be kind of be the same regardless of the basis we choose. So the idea is that in order to kind of reduce the number of wave functions we're looking at, we'll construct a truncated matrix after these m steps. Um, and we'll call this kind of truncated unitary matrix UR. 
So the idea is that what this is doing, this UR, is that it's uh, constructing a set of orthonormal wave functions, uh, and it's constructed the set which are kind of associated with the largest eigenvalues of the overlap matrix. This part is essentially like principal component analysis. We know we don't want to kind of, after that, however many steps, we don't want to kind of keep doubling the number of wave functions we're storing. So at a certain point, we just kind of cut it off. And this is where the low rank approximation comes in, that we, uh, we transform our wave functions to a new basis uh, based on this overlap ma matrix and just store some pre-specified number R of them. And obviously we need to kind of do some uh, appropriate normalization of that. But after doing this, we obtain this sort of low rank approximation. So to reiterate, um, the way you would kind of use this low rank approximation is that you would start with some, uh, some initial state psi, and then you would kind of evolve at each step psi with these kind of uh, effective propagators, and you'd save the set of psi's that you're getting out with this. So you'd evolve one with UK, and you'd evolve one with VK. And so if there are kind of uh, K of these operators, after one step, you'll have K wave functions. And after two steps, you'll have K squared wave functions. And you keep going until that number exceeds some rank that you've pre-specified. And once you've uh, exceeded that rank, you cut them down with this kind of basis transformation. You're picking out the principal components. And then you just start again from there. So in this way, what we're getting is K wave function, or sorry, rather R wave functions of length N rather than a density matrix uh, of size n squared. So the point is that provided that r is much, much smaller than n, both in terms of the time it takes for a single step and the storage required to save uh, information about our system, we're saving roughly a factor of n on these things. So let's now have a look at, the, at how this low rank approximation works in practice. I'm gonna talk about three systems one of which is basically trivial, but we'll still need to talk about it. Um, I'm not gonna, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the Hamiltonians, but I'm not gonna show you the full models because I don't think they're kind of super relevant. But here's, an, here's our kind of very first simple example of a two-state system where there's some dissipation and uh, where there's some dephasing, and there's also some kind of driving uh, with a kind of lead. The important point is that when I talk about this, the dephasing, I mean kind of her mission, dissipators and then with the kind of the driving of the leads I mean some non-hermission dissipators that are attached uh, to kind of simulate almost like a current running through the system but this is just a simple two-state system and what we immediately see here so this kind of dissipation free line would be this is the evolution if I just drop the dissipators entirely so this is a Louvillian evolution my black dashed line is the kind of the exact Limblad e evolution. And then here, this rank one and rank two are my kind of low rank approximations uh, for different values of R. What you see is that rank one, okay, you're starting to get the kind of damping behavior, but it's not quite right. But by rank two, you're getting it perfectly. So this is the first kind of indication that this method does indeed work. Uh, moving on. Because this kind of method is kind of generic, we can do it for fermionic and bosonic systems. So here's an example in the Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, you know, uh, spins can either be up or down uh, on this kind of chain of sites. Uh, and if there's an up and a down on the same site, there's some potential U associated with that. Um, you know, the simplest kind of non-trivial solid state model. Now, uh, we can kind of uh, use this uh, platform Q-spin to kind of uh, evolve this uh, using the kind of Limblad equation uh, and also with our low rank approximation. And so kind of on the right hand side, here's an example for kind of six sites, which takes a horrendously long time to do an exact evolution. You can kind of see that as you, as you increase the rank, you're actually getting kind of closer and closer and closer to the real uh, current that you see in this model. What's really interesting is that actually, um, if you look at this in the frequency space, uh, what's missing in this kind of low rank approximation is kind of a constant offset. So the frequency spectrum actually kind of pretty well matches almost perfectly, even at a relatively low rank. Now on the left hand side here, you can actually see, um, <coughs> pardon me, uh, you can actually see kind of, uh, uh, essentially this is, the, this is an error of 
uh, integrating the difference between the predicted exact current and the current you get from your low rank approximation, you know, root mean square in some way. Uh, so this is just kind of characterizing how far away the low rank approximation is from the exact result for this kind of expectation. Uh, and I plotted this against the kind of computation time, but obviously the higher your rank, the longer the computation time. And what you can see is that kind of you're getting pretty good improvements. And there's kind of a sweet spot here where you've, where you've reduced, uh, uh, where you're still kind of um, almost two orders of magnitude uh, quicker than the exact simulation time, but you've kind of reduced your error compared to this uh, uh, by kind of, again, almost two orders of magnitude compared to kind of taking a rank one approximation. So you can kind of see that, yes, this is, this is kind of offering speed ups versus exact simulations. Uh, and what's really interesting is that because of this, you know, here's a, here's a in, in this example, this was for six sites. If I just stick to the low rank approximation in general and kind of wait for things to start to converge and say, okay, once it's converged, no, I can kind of be reasonably confident based on what I've seen before. I can do the same kind of system, but now for 14 sites. Now trying to do 14 sites uh, evolving with a density matrix would just be uh, an absurd amount of resources. But you know, with this low rank approximation, we can do this. Uh, and again, what you see is that this kind of, this power spectrum uh, does some fairly interesting things. Uh, <coughs> in fact, this is somewhat re uh, reminiscent of this phenomenon, high harmonic generation, which uh, you've probably heard me talk about before. Um, so this is interesting to me for a few reasons, but I won't kind of go into it or labor the point, especially because I have about uh, only a few minutes left. So this is where, things get really interesting. So this is an example of a Heisenberg spin chain. Again, uh, this is something with, uh, in, in this case, I didn't put any dephasing operators in there. So it's just like there's two leads on the end sites uh, or other uh, four leads because one will be kind of doing spin plus, one spin minus at one terminal, one's doing spin plus one, uh, and one spin minus at the other terminal. Now what we see here is that kind of, uh, <coughs> Here's kind of the dynamics of the various kind of uh, Z expectations for the spins. I've not kind of labeled them, um, but in the top, you can kind of see the exact evolution and then the low rank and they match up kind of perfectly, which is really nice. Uh, then uh, taking a Monte Carlo approach that I kind of talked about before, uh, if you implement this, you see that kind of it's doing much worse. And this is kind of in a regime of very weak coupling to the dissipators. Uh, and you might say, okay, well then maybe it's the fact that uh, in this kind of weak coupling regime, you're basically reproducing Louvillian dynamics, but if you turn the dissipators off, you get fundamentally different dynamics anyway. So this is a real effect that in this weak coupling regime, uh, the low rank approximation does very well at reproducing the exact dynamics, whereas the Monte Carlo uh, dynamics don't. The really nice thing about this is that if you compare the timings for all of these, your kind of your exact runtime is long. Uh, your Monte Carlo runtime is an order of magnitude down, and the low rank runtime is an order of magnitude down from that. So not only is this uh, more accurate, it's also quicker in this regime. And so here's a here's an example of kind of various kind of dephasing um, <coughs> uh, dephasing rates. Uh, and the performance of the low rank approximation versus Monte Carlo. Uh, now, what I, one thing I should say is that uh, what's weak coupling, what's strong coupling, uh, well, kind of at this kind of 10 to the minus two level, um, when you kind of put it in, the size of the dissipative terms relative to the Hamiltonian terms, they're kind of uh, bigger, and here they're of about the same order, and then here they're kind of uh, of a much smaller order. And so you can kind of see um, that at kind of this gamma 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus three, the low rank approximation comfortably outperforms uh, Monte Carlo, both in terms of, uh, <coughs> uh, definitely in terms of accuracy and also in terms of runtime for that accuracy. Uh, now, as you kind of get into the stronger coupling regime, Monte Carlo does better and this low rank approximation does worse, uh, which is sort of what you'd expect. That if you're doing a low rank approximation and you're picking out the principal components, if all of the dissipators have a large effect, um, uh, it's going to be hard to kind of sift out 
uh, the the most uh, the kind of the couple of wave functions that are having the biggest effect on the system. Uh, but you can kind of still see with the scaling here. I kind of include this extra point that if you that if you keep kind of going to higher ranks and you want smaller errors, you might expect that there is a point where this crosses over this kind of line for the Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, just as a final thing, I'll show you kind of a direct comparison of these two uh, points, the kind of the worst case for both of them to give you a sense of kind of actually what does this error mean when you're looking at it by eye. And so here uh, you can kind of see that here the, here the low rank approximation, it does very well at kind of capturing the uh, spins closest, uh, whose magnitude is closest to zero, but then as they kind of get larger, it gets the magnitude wrong. Although if you see by eye, it still kind of gets the dynamics of them right, that it gets kind of uh, the relative changes uh, pretty well. It's just that it doesn't have the kind of precise size. Whereas here, you can kind of see the Monte Carlo simulation is still all over the place. So it, it's, it's just to say that, you know, even, even when this gets it wrong, it still gets it, a, you still get a sense of kind of what the dynamics are actually doing. Okay, and I think that is more or less it. So obviously, I wasn't doing this work alone. Uh, Dennis uh, is uh, the PI in my group. Uh, and so he kind of had the original idea for this uh, and left it to me to kind of do the implementation. And we're also working with Kurt Jacobs uh, on this, uh, specifically because as you'll see later, he has kind of constructed the Limbladian upgrade for the block Redfield equation, which happens to be very useful when you have weak coupling uh, in open systems. So that's basically my talk. Uh, you know, you want to evolve open systems, but the density matrix is a bit of a pig for evolving because of its poor scaling with the size of the Hilbert space dimension. Um, low rank approximations are kind of a new alternative method, let's say, uh, that in certain circumstances can be both accurate, more accurate and faster than other approximate methods that are well known. Uh, okay, so that's it. Thank you all for listening. All right, thank you very much. Interesting stuff. Um, so we're pretty much right on time. So we have time for a few questions. If anybody has any, go ahead and jump right in. I have, I have a question. Oh, I, I guess Sai raised his hand. Why don't you go ahead, Sai? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So okay. Thank thank you very much for that talk. I, I was just wondering. Um, um, so in spirit, this is uh, a lot like DMRG techniques right in the sense that you just you keep uh, you keep successively truncating basically um, the 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 hilbert space in that case and 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 for you it's basically this uh, uh, the number of operators that you have mm -hmm. is there a kind of um, you know i mean we know if entanglement grows too quickly then 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 those techniques fail so is there a kind of analogous statement here like i'm trying to i mean this sounds very interesting so my immediate question is what, what are the warning flags? Like, where should I be careful about not using this? Uh, that's a very interesting, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so the relationship to DMRG hadn't occurred to me until you've just said it now. Uh, but I would say the warning flags are essentially, look, you know, kind of, you have a sense of what rank is this going to require? Well, the more dissipators you have uh, uh, in your system, the kind of, uh, the more you're going to be proliferating each step and the more of an effect you expect these to have. So I'd say kind of the warning flag that you uh, need a lot of, uh, that you're going to need a very high rank and you can't kind of just truncate at a low level is probably something along the lines of uh, two things. Uh, strong couplings, which kind of really dis differentiate between your U and V uh, propagators and then also um, having a great many of them. Uh, just because then any truncation you do, you're kind of, you're still pro proliferating a lot of the next step and you're kind of, whatever you're missing is being kind of magnified in that one step by all of the propagators, uh, uh, all of the kind of very different propagators that you're applying to it. So I'd, I'd say kind of number of dissipators and strength of coupling are, um, are where you'd want to see the kind of the warning flags. And, and you can see that because as you change the rank, um, you're not getting kind of good convergence. The behavior can completely change between kind of rank 16 and rank 17, something like this. That, that's what I would say is the kind of the warning flag that it's not working. But in, in all the cases we've studied so far, it kind of, it, it does, it, uh, you have to kind of put almost pathologically strong couplings in before it, 
before that starts to happen. Uh, could I just ask one last quick uh, question? Uh, do, you, uh, do you get open quantum system phase transition physics right with this? Like, I mean, you showed Fermi Hubbard, or you know, if I want to do Bose Hubbard, for instance, do you get Morton Slater versus, you know, I mean, I don't know what the open quantum system version of this would be, but you know, we can work it uh, out. Again, a good question. Uh, so, so far, this isn't something we've checked, but it's on the list. Um, so yeah, this is this this is something we're kind of okay, we're thanks. we're working towards now. But yeah, the the, the results I've shown you are kind of uh, quite fresh at the moment. All right, maybe one more quick question. I think Mark had a question. Yeah, I'll keep it quick. Um, th this is a very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you're doing these low rank approximations. And um, I think a natural question is, th this is essentially like a simulation of a quantum system. And that has been advocated as actually one of the main uses, uh, one of the main potential applications of quantum computing and even near term quantum computing. And so what I'm wondering is if you thought about how to do this low rank approximation on a quantum computer. That is another excellent question. Uh, and I, I, I feel I feel kind of bad because uh, you know these are all these are all kind of applications that uh, haven't kind of crossed our mind yet. But it's uh, again, it's it, it's one of those things that yes, it would definitely be. My my gut would say yes, this should be something that you should be able to do on a quantum computer because it is just kind of the the steps are essentially just linear algebra, and so you should be able to kind of construct some set of gates that would do that, right? Um, so I I would say yes, you kind of. You, you should, it, it should be something you should be able to do. Uh, how you would actually implement that, I'd have to think about though. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I, that, that may not be a very satisfying answer. No, it's <laughs> fine. It, it, it sounds like a great topic for future research, which is one of the purposes of Quill. <laughs> no, oh. great, thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, Gerard. Um, so you. now I think we have a 